London, 1872. I have entered into the service of a new gentleman. It would seem... He is a gambling man. Welcome, Gamer Nation, to the 2017 SKS Summer Gambling! This is 80 Days. This is the first game on the docket. This is brought to you by Scarlet Ranger. In 80 Days, we are going to try to make it around the globe. In 80 Days, obviously. Because we have accepted a bet. But technology in this 1872 is totally different than that that we know of in our modern history present. Yes, that's what I'll say. But let's see what this game will bring to us. Eagle presents Other Fine Product in association with Cape Guy. Directed by John Ingold and Joseph Humry. Your announcer, SKS. The script by Meg, JF. Ben Nicholson on PC and Mac edition. There's America. Well, hello, America. There's Kentucky there somewhere. 80 days. I'm very excited to play this. This is a blind playthrough, so I have no idea what I'm getting into. Based on the novel by Jules Verne. There's London. And here's Paris. And I bet over here's... Berlin, maybe, right there? What else do we have? That's Rome. That's probably... Cairo? Or Alexandria and Cairo? Either Tokyo or... The music's coming in pretty loud on my side. I hope it's okay for you all. Oh, look at this. Oh, I wonder if that's Atlanta. That's probably uh, New Orleans. Miami. Interesting, but we're here in London. And it says to click to begin. In these other cities that I don't know. Trying to see what would be. I'm not sure what that one would be. Alright, let's hit this. London! Oh, check out that background. This is amazing. This is really nice. The begin button. Monsieur Felice Fogg returned home early from the Reform Club and is in, an, in a newfangled steam carriage. A side. That is so sophisticated. Monsieur Felius Fogg returned to home early. It is italicized and bolded in a newfangled steam carriage. Inside. I helped him down. And the iron lunge steam driven horses clattered away. Pass a pot out. Pass a pot out, he said. We're going around the world. Around the world, monsieur? Very good, monsieur. Let's play around the world. Around the world, monsieur? I asked, utterly astonished. We shall circumnavigate the globe within 80 days. He was quite calm as he proposed this wild scheme. We leave for Paris on the 825 in an hour. But I have not prepared. You are a jest. This was a shocking turnabout. <laughs> this, I would probably say that surely you jest. But I have not prepared, I said wretchedly, quickly trying to organize a list of necessary items in my mind. Then do it now. Pack an altometer. Uh, in my evening jacket. There's not a moment to waste. Really? We're going to go around the world in your evening jackets? What you think of? You pass apart. Now have funds. Your character is now steadfast. Ooh. So if I would have picked something else, I would have started with something else. Interesting. Okay, so we're going to go to Paris. That's our new route. Collect our things and we'll be off. Oh, wow. Check out this time. Alright, so we have wool trousers. Part of the Englishman's wardrobe. Set. A wool shirt. Uh, so what do we have here? We have a wax cylinder. It's valuable in Vienna, Paris, and Copenhagen. Where we're going to Paris. Uh, he wanted his evening jacket, so we have to take that. Altimeter. Air sickness is psychological. An altimeter can... Altimeter? That's probably how it's pronounced, now that I'm reading it. The altimeter can be most... Because it's altitude, and it's a meter for the altitude. So altimeter, that's what I'll say now. Uh, yeah, we probably need that. And... A Splendor volume listing all shipping routes within Europe. Uh, well, we're going to be on land over Europe, so we probably don't need the shipping routes. Playing cards. And soldier tech. 
Uh, oh no, no, we have to take this so we can sell it. All right, we're packed. Our completed Englishman's World Road should help us navigate times of the upper class journey. Negotiate time. Oh, okay. So how you dress plays an important role. Okay. I've never played this game before. So Scarlet Ranger has really set us up on something. <laughs> All right. So we're going to Paris. Just to take a ticket, I guess. Uh, let's see, the guard's van has space for one suitcase, which will suffice to travel. This promises to be a bearable route. Okay. Oh, this is neat. Check this out. I like this. It's sad we couldn't go to Cambridge. The mechanical horses raced past Piccadilly Circus and Pall Mall. It's a brand of cigarettes. I don't smoke, but one of my professors in college talked about those all the time. And that makes sense now. Since he was a British historian. Wow. Faster than a team of thoroughbreds. Even so, the whistle of the 825 was blowing as we pulled up to the Charing Cross Station. We have no tickets, I exclaimed. We raced along the concourse and threw ourselves aboard. Okay, we can't miss this train. Uh, so let's just jump. We raced along the concourse and threw ourselves aboard as the second whistle shrieked its warning. We barely had time to take our seats before the guard rapped smartly on the compartment door. He held out a hand. Tickets, please. Alas, monsieur, we were in a great hurry. I pretended to have lost them. Ah, uh, let's just be honest. Alas, monsieur, we were in a great hurry, I explained, giving him a beseeching look. We do not have time to buy tickets. You may purchase them for me, the guard was saying, though it is more expensive, I'm afraid. 85 pounds, please. I argued with him or handed over 85 pounds. We'll hand them over. I handed over 85 pounds and smiled a thin smile. From one working man to another, the guard gave me our tickets and slid the compartment door shut behind him with a pneumatic hiss. Your funds have gone down somewhat. I am on fine form, but we must make haste. Well, I cannot make the train go fast. Is, is there a bridge over the English Channel? What kind of world are we in right now? London smog gave way to the rolling hills and pastures of the Kentish countryside, still untouched by the hand of technological advancement. Okay, the uh, Industrial Revolution has really went farther away. Monsieur Fogg read his paper whilst I repacked our bags. I demanded to know the purpose of our journey. We passed the day in silence. I can't really demand because I work for him. Let's just repack the bag. Monsieur Fogg read his paper whilst I repacked the bags, thrown together in haste and confusion. As afternoon turned inexorably into evening, I discovered that my master was one of those gentlemen who broke their silence rarely, if at all. A guard rapped on our door. A few times miles before Dover. We are about to submerge, you warn. Take some bit take some people a bit of funny. So watch out. What do you mean submerge? But it is safe, is it not? Very good. What do you mean submerge? I cried. This is the London to Paris Amphorite Express, he explained, as though to a particularly dim witted child. The submersible train. Talk of all the London papers. Then this is the Murr train. I'm totally going to say this. I exclaimed. He made a face. Bloody journalists and their silly names, he muttered. Every inch of her has been examined and stamped with an artifice of steel. This is the world's only bathyscape locomotive. I cannot help a shiver. I press my face to the window glass. Well, let's watch. As the fins above the Amphorite's wheels extended with a hydraulic hiss. Night fell as we plunged past the end of the track into freezing waters of the English Channel. Interesting. I still don't see how that would work, though. The Amphorite. Amphortrite? There's a TR there. Plowed through the water overnight and splashed up onto the water gouge French tracks at Calais at dawn broke. Do you have a route in mind, Monsieur? I demanded to know the purpose. I began to consider what we might require for our journey. Yeah, let's ask him if he has a route. Do you have a route in mind, Monsieur? I asked as the water of the channel dried from the compartment windows. I am as yet undecided, my master admitted. The new canal has sped up the shipping route from Suez to Bombay, though perhaps we could take the Trans-Siberian Railway across Russia. Surely not Bombay! Surely not Siberia! Surely not Siberia, I exclaimed. It is so cold and grim, and I have a particular fear of bears. Then why would we... Then we would do well to buy furs, he replies, refraining from rolling his eyes. There are other alternatives. 
We must travel overland across the Black and Caspian Sea. But which is fastest, but which is safest? Safest, not safest. Uh, we're wanting speed, fastest. I believe he said, that is what we shall put to the test. Pablo, I scarcely knew what to think. He doesn't know. We arrived at Paris Gare du Nord uh, just after one o'clock. Automaton porters lifted our luggage and then our persons onto the platform with long, delicately filigreed iron arm. Paris, city of my heart. I was home, but not to stay. Okay, so we've discovered some new routes. We have Suez Canal to Jeddah. And around Saudi Arabia and Yemen and Oman there. At to Bombay. Ooh, that's probably good. But we have the Moscow route. Which just seems like it would be full of death. Oh, man. Decisions already. Several of our possessions would be quite valuable here. Okay. We'll go to the market then. Ah, this does for that. Okay, we'll sell this. Oh, we could sell that. Make money, but no. Nah. This wine here. A magnificent bottle of Chateau de Yaquim, 1860. 32 bucks. It's 2300 in Berlin. Okay, we have to do that. Um... Valuable in Copenhagen, or Copenhagen, Warsaw, and Budapest. I really want to buy that, but we'd have to buy another suitcase. Huh. So we don't really have any route. We need to go to Berlin. But then we're probably going to have to take a go down here. That gets us there to there. If we go up here to Moscow, that puts us way out here. But I don't know how we can make the jump to Hawaii without going to Port Moresby. Okay. I feel like we need to buy this extra suitcase. I want that traveling coat for now. And we'll sell that wine when we get there. Okay. We've lost some time. I'm an idiot. Because I... Can you not pause the uh, time? Alright, we'll stay at the hotel. It's already day three. We took a hotel for the night. We will be comfortable here, Monsieur Fogg remarked, but traveling overnight will be often be more efficient. So we must board the longest journeys so we must board the longest journeys available where possible. We cannot travel where it is not possible, certainly, he replied. Still, the surrounds of the hotel ritz were most enjoyable. Okay, let's explore. We don't have a route. Oh, there we go. That's how we find that. But if you are to spare, I ask Monsieur Fogg if I might enjoy the city before we had leave. Indeed, and you should learn anything in note. Be sure to relay it. But do not waste any time. We have no time to spare. I nodded and headed into town. The talk of the streets was one thing. An enormous, elegant, oval stadium constructed upon the green fields of Pomp de, Pomp de Mars and containing the technological marvels, art, museums, amusement, parks, and milling crowds of the World's Fair of 1872. My city still wore the scars of last year's siege. I ventured inside. I ventured inside. Why not? I went to the World's Fair. An artificer was replacing an arc light. I went west towards the airship hangar. Ooh. Past the booth with a husband and wife pair selling panoramic hot air balloon rides to Ego Tours. I inquired to their alloy rate. 
I'm wondering if perhaps the balloon could be encouraged to go a little way east as well and contribute to our great journey. 80 pounds for a half hour flight, the man responded. I guess this is robbery. The man struck. We're the only balloonist here today. Are you willing to miss out on the experience of a flight over Paris? I'm going around the world. I replied, I hope for much more impressive sights in the days to come. The man nodded and moved on to the next punter with great swiftness. I regarded the airships that filled the hangar behind him. There was a, no a huge number on display from all over the world, and my eye was immediately caught by... Hmm. African made, the gilded Egyptian, the metal clad, the vodka atomic... Peruvian gyrocopter. Let's do the Egyptian one, though. Stylish puppies and feathers. It resembled nothing more than a vast flying sarcophagus. Do people really fly in such things? I asked the exhibitor. Indeed, hundreds of them do every day, he replied with a booming laugh. They say the skies of Arabia are crisscrossed with the trails of Egyptian ship. Perhaps one day soon, Monsieur Fogg and I would find ourselves flying in such a craft. I returned to the exposition center, my thoughts turning with clouds and engine rotors. Avenues sprawled in every direction between the inviting and illuminated pavilions of the exposition. Let's do this arc light -like guy. She first disconnected the strange machine powering lights. It had a spinning iron wheel which was wound around with a series of armature coils. What is that device, Artificer? I asked politely, my eyes staying to the coppery, copper lily pin which proclaimed her profession. It's a bleeding nuisance, is what it is, the Artificer grumbled. I don't know why she had that accent. In a thick Yorkshire accent. These grand machines are finicky beasts. Grand machines? Is that so? I have often found that to be the case. I replied gouchily. Oh yes, you're an artificer, are you? You look like a stuffed bird. I laughed. No, artificer, merely a valet. Well, then, when I have a gear shaft that needs its whiskers trimming, I'll call for you. I retreated hastily, not in all terror of her irate tone. The harshness of her tone was bellied by her gentle touch. Oh god, he's got a crush on her. As she unscrewed the arc light's globe and enameled glass and replaced the two carbon rods within, she reconnected the supply and the tin Yavlakov handles connected in series lit up once more. Will all the streets be lit with electricity soon? I asked. There are already a fair passel of cities lit by electricity rather than gaslight, she retorted. London will probably be last, given old Queen Vicky's prejudice against the Artificer's Guild. But Paris is modern, and we still use gaslights. Surely London's, London is the capital of capital of invention. There are even prevothic steam carriages on the streets, he says. The artist gave me a pitying, pitying look. London's not as advanced as you think, laddie, she replied. There are more automata in the colonies than on London Street. She looked at her pocket watch, cursed, and hurried off, dropping something as she went. I pocketed it. It was a guild medallion, a token of membership favor that might prove useful should we encounter other artificers along the path. I looked about me once more. Crowds of tourists jostled and heaved past, their eyes with wide with wonder. Ooh, I could go to the Artificers Guild, just stroll down the Avenue of Nations. Uh, let's go to the Artificers Guild. Draped with banners and bowsled by their copperly sigil. A uh, steam-powered automaton orchestra played gleaming brass instruments. I had the most incredible display of machines. I don't know how any of this is helping us. Uh, it had the most incredible display of machines, as though a scrapyard had been brought to playful life. One of the artificers uh, was explaining the guild's credo to a group of sticky-fingered children. He had his hands deep in a human-shaped automaton. The copper lily stamp of the guild is an assurance of safety and quality, the artificer said, before pausing to gently discourage a curious toddler ambitions on flight. We build and maintain everything from children's toys. She gestured to a nearby clockwork monkey, which was enthusiastically banging a pair of cymbals, to airship engines and even mechanical workers. A mechanical valet could be never replace a human one. I leaned closer and remained silent. I slipped away, bemused by all the talk of machine. Let's just lean closer eager to hear more of this wondrous, mechanized future. An automaton worker will never tire or feel hungry or thirst. It can function happily under the hot glare of the sun and will not get fossy jawed or cotton lung if it works in a factory. But it can it feel loyalty or satisfaction? 
Surely an automaton isn't expensive to fuel as a human is the feed. Ooh, that's a good question. If not more, the artificer released the child now squirming in her arms and gave me a lopsided grin. For now. But we hope to build our automata more efficiently and find cheaper fuels. She raised her voice a little to address the small crowd that had gathered to eavesdrop on our exchange. The Artificers Guild across the borders of nations operates across the borders of nation, caste, and creed. In which countries? I called. All of them, she replied, pleased at the question. We have outposts on Bombay, Siberia, Bucharest, and every corner of the earth. She turned back to the children. When we become artificers, we give up our personal loyalties and swear to use our skills for only peaceful aims. The artificer continued, The cleverest of engineers and inventors, all working together to shape a better future for the world. I clapped along with the rest of the crowd. I remained somewhat skeptical of the rosy picture she painted. No organization was so perfect and noble. The artificer caught my sleeve and the crowd dispersed. How was my speech? I rehearsed it all night. Was it too much? Uh, was any of it true? It was very stirring. Perhaps a bit much. Let's be honest. I offered with a shrug as she bit her lip. I will tone it down for next time. She nodded thoughtfully and gave me a distracted wave as I returned to the central square, stopping here and there to gaze at the wonders of the exposition. My feet were tiring, and the hour was growing late. I returned to Monsieur Frog, who was eating a meal of plain boiled beef a la gazans? I don't know. Did you enjoy the exposition, my master inquired def 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 definitely. As though I'd been out visiting a great-aged aunt, having preferred a hearty meal of English newspaper, and I nodded. Nothing else could possibly impress me now. We are unspeakably lucky to live in such an age of invention. We will travel by airship, do you suppose? You think we need to encounter artificers in our travels? I think this would be the one to talk about, because that's what we did. We mentioned them. Assuredly, I intend for us to use the most efficient transport available. I dreamed that night of mechanical wonders and automatons with beautifully enameled faces, knowing little of strange inventions and stranger peoples. I would soon encounter my journey across the world. Your character is now well healed. All right. Let's depart. So we can go to Amsterdam today. And we need to go to Berlin. So yeah, let's do this. Ooh, the mouth. 1500 and Karachi. Wow. Minus five health. Private car. Oh, we can't do that. We have two suitcases. Okay. Now this is kind of... Arrives Saturday. Englishman's wardrobe should yield result. Most generous, no charge at 6 p.m. All right. Okay, we'll hire some space for the luggage, and we'll go. Boom! That's how we take care of problems, everybody. Boarding the Orient Express was an altogether calmer affair than our race through London had been. Mechanical porters loaded us in through the windows, then snapped them shut with a delicate click. The train was beautiful. The train was extremely fast. The train would be the first leg of a much longer journey. It could sweep us across the whole Europe, at, or at least as far as the Deutsches Kaiserreich, where the track currently ceased. A long, la a last long whistle blew and we began our journey east. But before we begin our journey east, I think I'm going to end this episode here. We've hit the 25 minute mark. I hope you're enjoying this adventure so far. Remember, this is part of the 2017 Summer Game Blip. This episode is brought to you by Scarlet Ranger. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see what we run into next time. Good night, everybody.